all the things are bad. There are no good things. I'm white and I've got everything I need. No one clutches their purses when they're in a room alone with me. And I can drive for any neighborhood I please. At any hour, and the police don't do a thing. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I've got everything I need I'm a guy getting paid more than a girl with a degree And I can walk down the streets after dark, no one wants to rape me And I can get a girl pregnant and just as easily flee Just like my straight white male dad did to me So if I see a penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need I've got a pile of broken mirrors And I'm walking under ladders And I'm spilling tons of salt But to me that doesn't matter Cause my skin and my gender and my orientation Are the best things to have if you live in this nation I recommend it highly A penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Shit's gonna work out for me Cause I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Hey everybody, welcome to the Intellectual Dollar Tree The uh, flagship show of uh, OBS Updates Breaking all of my stuff <laughs> oh boy <laughs> uh you can uh, support this project at echoplexmedia.com click the support tab there's some great new conspiracy bingo uh merch there uh that uh has nothing to do with obs studio and so it is not broken um and there's patreon patreon.com slash echoplex i'm producer dave you can find me on grinder complaining about obs and i'm hk Perrin. you can find me on mastodon at H Perrin at port87.social. Fantastic. So I don't know if you've heard the news, but uh, Ben Shapiro and his employee, Candace Owens, are fighting. Oh, how lovely. Yeah, it all started with a tweet. Um, <clears throat> I'd show it, but I have a feeling this interview that she did like immediately after they started beefing with each other on Twitter uh, that she decided to do with Tucker Carlson is probably going to show the tweets. So I don't want to go over it twice. Seems a little contrived because it's like not long after they had um, their beef going on, <laughs> uh, she was immediately uh, being interviewed by Tucker Carlson. So who knows? Conspiracy? I think not. Look at that. The media wenches in the chat. She's like, yep, I'm going to watch this one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, without any further ado, here is uh, Candace Owen responds to Ben Shapiro in Tucker Carlson interview from three hours ago. Inquisition hauled in Galileo, the Italian astronomer, and commanded him to stop saying that the Earth revolves around the sun. Shut up, they said. Everyone knows that's wrong, and you're a bad person for saying otherwise. I mean, specifically, it was the church that about knew that it was wrong, quote unquote. <laughs> right, this is dumb. Is he going to compare Candace Owens to fucking Galileo? <laughs> now, 400 years later, because the authorities were completely wrong. Galileo is a hero. They are fools. And we explain this by pointing out that they were religious nuts. They were superstitious. Nothing like that could ever happen now. But it turns out the one constant in human history is human nature. And not only does it happen now, it happens more than ever. Watch Candace Owens get widely attacked, not by one person, but by everyone. <laughs> Maybe it's you, Candace. Right. People like Candace Owens and others have been flagrant at putting out disinformation into the public sphere. The top performing post of the week was this post by Candace Owens, a far right wing commentator and a favorite on Fox, denigrating George Floyd. It just shows how this website is a radicalization engine. You, you do have this sort of parade of, of MAGA world that are parroting Russian talking points. Tucker Carlson 
Candace Owens, Tulsi Gabbard. I think somewhere along the line, they don't believe this, but they think that it's in their interest to say these things. These people. I like actually are, think that doesn't matter. Whether or not they believe it. Right. Because they're, they're, this yeah. is in their capacity as public figures that they're saying all this stuff, whatever it is they're talking about in this particular clip. And they're convincing other people to believe it. So. Yeah. yeah. They're almost collaborators. That Candace Owens video was the top video on Facebook this past week. And she's, you know, saying all sorts of things about George Floyd and, and denying any systemic racism problems. And so there's a deeper fundamental issue with what the Facebook algorithm and all social media algorithms, what kind of content they reward. Others doubled down on vaccine disinformation. Folks like right wing commentator Candace Owens, who told followers that she wouldn't take the vaccine even on her deathbed. Well, but then it would be too late anyway. Notice <laughs> why they were attacking Candace Owens. What did she say? She said, well, actually, George Floyd was not murdered by a racist cop, much less by a systemically racist society. She said, actually, the vaccine doesn't work very well and it may be dangerous. She went on to say, but both no, of those things are false. Is not going to The win. first one, I guess you could say is a matter of opinion, I guess. And if you really want to stretch it, but the second one's just false. The war against Russia. And for saying these things, every one of which is proven true, she what? was attacked as an immoral person, a racist and a traitor to her country. What's interesting, however, is that no one leveling those taxes ever apologized to her. And so maybe like Galileo, she's going to have to wait for her descendants. Kind of like she's going to be remembered like Galileo. Get <laughs> the fuck out of here. Oh, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> also, I like the idea of like someone saying, you know what? You may not believe me, but your great, great grandchildren will. So ha, I win. That seems unfair. <laughs> We decided to invite Candace Owens into the studio and congratulate her face to face. Candace Owens, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. By the way, me. you're about to have another discussion. Like immediately to his studio note. Ah, this is contrived, dude. I don't know if Ben's in on it and they're doing this to get attention or but like this is contrived. He unless this is a fake studio, he's like in the middle of fucking nowhere. <laughs> like and she's I think she's from like LA or fucking Austin or no, maybe a Nashville or something like that. And he's like in the I mean, Pacific, he's in the Northeast somewhere. This is all contrived. I'm going to guess it's like not a fake studio, but like, I don't think he's like out in the middle of the woods. I think it's like a wooded area in oh, suburbia. Yeah. Yeah. He's in the, like, but he's in like New England somewhere. Actually, yeah. 40, <laughs> 40 weeks, but I was not missing this. I was so excited. So I'm nice. honored to be here. Well, so it's, is it a little, it's a little weird to see yourself, look, we all get things wrong. I certainly have gotten a lot of things wrong. I think it's fair to be attacked for getting it wrong. But if you get it right, and it's proven that you got it right, and in three instances it has been proven that you did on the biggest issues of the day, shouldn't the people who attacked you apologize? And shouldn't someone at least point out, hey, Candace Owens was right about that? No, I think. But wait a minute, if she wasn't right. You can't just declare that you were right and then be like, now you need to apologize. Like they're they're saying that she was right about stuff about George Floyd. That stuff was her opinion. Um, and then the vaccine stuff, she's just wrong. They, they, what they, this relies on the, their Nirvana fallacy in the vaccine. This is what this relies on. They just keep doing it. They don't do that Tylenol. Happen is they have too much ego and they're too proud and they want to sort of move on and pretend that they weren't as radical as they were in their yes. stances. Wait, and what? Calling you a grandma killer, you know, if you wanted to go out the door and get groceries or if you wanted to maybe see your grandma because grandma shouldn't be dying alone, even if she is. But everybody went to the grocery store. Dying. Um, so it takes a tremendous amount of humility to admit that you were wrong. People prefer to then pretend the internet will forget and just that they had more nuance than they did uh, on the issue of the day, which is fine with me. I'm totally I mean, fine it's one thing that. not to admit you're wrong. I understand it's difficult to do that. I have to force myself. But to attack <laughs> other people for being he, He's like, I understand it's difficult to do that. I haven't done it yet, but... <laughs> apologize for it. it does seem immoral. 
it is immoral. And when we're living in an environment where there is a lot of media immorality, you know, people would rather you parrot certain talking points rather than have a meaningful discussion and a meaningful dialogue. And they don't accept it. And at the moment that they start to censor speech and they start talking, you know, calling you names, like calling you a grandma killer, calling you a pro Putin puppet, you know, it's because they don't actually believe what they're saying. But it's what if they believe that you're parroting talking points from the Kremlin, whether whether you were consciously doing it or you're just not very uh, media savvy and you just repeat shit? Like, what what if they believe that? Like, this is the thing that. It's one of the things that I don't do. I try not to do this. I just assume that people don't share my view on things, right? I think that that's a likely scenario and that people see things differently than I do. And I don't just assume that people don't believe what they're saying because they're not saying what I think they should say. That's a fucking crazy thing to think about other people. There are people out there who are disingenuous and who are grifters, but like you can't know for sure. Well, Dave Rubin's a grifter, but I think it's just because he's too stupid to do anything else. But that's a whole different matter. <laughs> just these are ad hominem attacks to dissuade from having an actual debate. And there always should be an actual debate on that right. issue. And when, and when they never. God, I wish nobody would have ever learned about the ad hominem. They just. And now anytime you <laughs> criticize anybody, they're like, that's an ad hominem. And I'm like, well, yeah, I am, in fact, making negative comments about your very poor character. Uh, what, what now? <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, yes, you caught me. That that was if we wouldn't have had to come up with the intellectual dollar tree, I think this podcast would have been called ad hominem with, with Dave and <laughs> Dave and HK or whatever. What you got wrong? They don't call it wrong. They call it disinformation, which mm -hmm. suggests it could be right. That's usually a tell. And, sp and speaking of, so I was out of the country yesterday um, and didn't have adequate internet access on the plane to really follow this. And I don't understand the context exactly, but um, the internet was dominated yesterday by video of Ben Shapiro who you work with at the Daily Wire, um, I think it's fair to say, attacking you. Here's the video, I just wanna get your reaction to it. Yes, uh, the, the question is about Candace Owens. I think her behavior during this has been disgraceful. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt, I think it's been disgraceful. I can't pause that. Is he like when standing he says on a... during this, what is he referring to? Um, she's been, so she, I haven't been keeping too much up on it, but she's been taking a, uh, like, a, strangely enough, a more moderate position about the conflict in the Middle East. Um, okay. But I uh, feel like the there's a, something underlying it is that she's pretty comfortable with anti-Semitic rhetoric and she's spread it in the past. And so her problem with Israel might be that uh, she sees it as Jewish, right? So, but I don't know, right? Again, but she's, the, what he doesn't like is that she's not like cheering on um, the IDF and the Likud government. And he thinks that she should do that. Okay. I've never seen this clip and I don't know the context, but that it couldn't be anything else. This is Ben Shapiro. If you go look at his Twitter, that's what he's doing. And that's sort of the, the line that's being towed by the Daily Wire. Okay. I think that I think that her her faux sophistication on these particular issues has been ridiculous. It's not faux sophistication; it's ridiculous. Everybody can see the moves that she's making and the things that she's saying, and I find them disreputable. So maybe there's a point in the video where he explains what exactly you did wrong and how you were wrong. I, I haven't seen it. Well, um, wait, this is your show, and you just played the video. <laughs> <laughs> What a wild way to say, look, I don't want to do any research for this show. I can't even watch. What if, if the video was even 20 minutes, he couldn't be bothered to watch it. If that video is 20 <laughs> minutes, we would have just run the whole fucking thing, right? <laughs> but he, quote, absolutely disgraceful, particularly a coworker, seems like a pretty big step. What, and, and I really don't know the background here. What is that about? You know, there isn't much of a background. I saw the video when everybody else saw it when I woke up. Um, no one, he, No one warned you about it. Nobody warned me about it. I, I, it looks like maybe he didn't know he was being recorded. It looks yes. like it was some sort of a private event. I got no clarity on the I th it looked like he was standing on a coffee table issue that he was particularly speaking on. And in what was said, I also I can't respond to it beyond what he's saying because it's just ad hominem attacks. I don't know because yeah, it's, it's not, you know, we disagree or yeah. I, you know, I, I don't think she's correct or maybe she doesn't know what she's talking about. It's absolutely disgraceful. Yeah. Exactly. And I don't know if it was an ad hominem attack. Like, 
he they don't know what at home reputable i guess but like he wasn't saying that about like all of his arguments were against her behavior not yeah. her as a person right he's got the, they've got the car going the wrong way right um you're wrong because you can go fuck yourself is sort of an ad hominem but you can go fuck yourself because you're wrong is just a reason you can go fuck yourself right <laughs> like, yeah like does candace know what an ad hominem attack is I think that that's why these people shouldn't have ever learned this word because ad hominem would be like, oh, you're gay. What do you know about women? Right. Yeah. Not that's that's specifically an ad hominem fallacy. Right. And an attack, though. Yes. But yeah, all ad hominem fallacies are ad hominem attacks, but not all ad hominem attacks are ad hominem fallacies. It's only if you're you're saying your argument is wrong because of who you are. That's when it becomes right. a fallacy. And Ben is not saying that, and he's also not even, like, denigrating her as a person. He's saying, like, I disagree with her behavior, and I find that it makes her disreputable. Right. Which, like, he and I might disagree about that uh, specifically on this case. I mean, we'll we'll definitely agree that she's disreputable, but, (laughs) you know, that's still, like, that's not an ad hominem attack. And the other thing that's that's very interesting is that he didn't, she had been blowing that fucking anti-Semitic dog whistle about the New World Order and the Great Replacement and all that this whole fucking time. And that was all hunky-dory for him until it was something where he fucking cared about the particular issue. And now it's, now it's bad because she's not taking like a strong position on the side of the conflict in the Middle East that he thinks she should take. And that that shows that Ben actually may be the one with the poor character in this in this particular exchange, because he's oh, just it could be both. Oh, right, but he but in this particular exchange, he's showing uh, more more of his ass essentially, because he's like, yes. "Wow, you're saying stuff I don't like." Wow, yeah. Respond to it on a level of intellect, because there there's nothing that he has expressed in that at least in that short clip that he fundamentally disagrees with in terms of what I said. But I will say that. I'm not going to respond with the same ad hominem attacks. Yes. I don't think it helps further discussion. Oh, call him a tiny that dancer. Was me that was caught on a video saying that about colleagues that I work with. I would be embarrassed. I would. So I think that the video speaks more to Ben's character than it speaks to mine. Has he texted you to apologize or explain or anything? No, nothing. I haven't heard a single word. It just was sort of something that he said. Yeah, this is the Daily Wire. This is all going to play out on Twitter. And you know what? Ben and I have many disagreements, so I don't think that that's particularly something that's interesting. Um, we disagreed on the COVID vaccine. We disagree yes. on Ukraine and Russia. He has taken virtually every stance that has been the opposite of mine on every issue uh, over the last five years. So I don't think that that's particularly the COVID remarkable. Vaccine. Really, I didn't remember that. Yeah, he was pro the COVID vaccine. I was anti the vaccine. You know, we were all idiots for not getting the vaccine. So that's totally fine. I, I am totally open to people having a difference in opinion. Right. I would hope that amongst colleagues that it would always be civil disagreement and i, I would He's also open to people having a difference of facts badly about ben it's just I would a little say, weird it's a little weird so he was on the left on those three biggest issues of our time wait no no ben shapiro was is, is, that was the position on he took on the vaccines was that of the moderate not of a leftist his position was you should get it and the government shouldn't force you to get it but you should get it and you're a dumbass if you don't <laughs> that's like a very moderate fucking middle of the road position actually it is not a leftist. Like there is no leftist position on the vaccines, right? The moderates and the leftists sort of have the same position. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't recall a whole lot of leftists. Like surely there were some, but I don't recall a whole lot saying like the government should force people to get the vaccine. You're saying he has converted his opinions. He's accepted responsibility. He said, you know, I was wrong about the vaccine. Oh, good. good uh, yeah. He is. Did he you know, say that? I don't think so. His mom's a doctor. And I say to people, I'm very aware of, my perspectives on big pharma and yes. i talk about it on my show openly and i think that that's a tremendous credit to the daily wire that they allow a difference of opinions but i would I, as i said hope that it would remain respectful yeah. and that you wouldn't throw your colleagues um under a bus so to speak i think, in that, a I, think that, I think that's fair and just just for clarity because i really don't know did, is he your boss does he I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about uh, Ben's involvement. He's not he's not the CEO of the Daily Wire. He yes. is not making the data agents of the Daily Wire. And I do want to make it very clear because people are like, how could you possibly save Daily Wire after this? 
I have a very good relationship with the co-CEOs of the Daily Wire. I, you know, especially right now, the acting CEO is uh, Caleb Robinson. He's a wonderful person. He's worked very hard to be where he's at. We have a lot in common that we connect on. And so people- Didn't Ben Shapiro start the Daily Wire? You know, Ben lives- Yeah, yeah, but he had to give up a lot of control of it, sort of, when he took the money. Okay. That's an oversimplification. I think there's probably a pretty good episode of Behind the Bastards about it, actually, if you wanted to get a deeper dive. Okay. In Florida, he's not a part of the day-to-day movement of the Daily Wire. You know, the rest of uh, the hosts have their shows situated in Nashville. So we see each other every day. We talk. There's great camaraderie. And there's actually more agreement. There's actually a lot of people that are, as I describe myself, just pro-America first. And I think I've been that way consistently throughout my political career. Whether people agree with it or not in different moments is up for debate. But there, I, I don't want that video to become a reflection of how the Daily Wire works and the Daily Wire operates because I have had a very good experience uh, with the CEOs and, you know, love Michael Knowles, love Matt Walsh. Oh, why, why? Andrew Clavin. We all get along really great. Well, it certainly speaks well to the Daily yeah. Wire. So it's not, I mean, a yeah, by like the that, way, when they say pro the America first, America first is just code for America only. Fuck everyone else. Yeah, yeah. It's a. Uh... Very, and not very, even America only, just like rich America only. Very, very, very close to the thing that uh, Nick Fuentes uh, espouses, actually. Oh, Candace Owens is out or something. That's yeah. not doesn't sound like that's what it means. At yeah, all. no, it's a you know, it's it's a small group of people. We see each other every day. Right. Brett Cooper is another one who who just joined about two years ago. She's great. She's up and coming. And there's a lot of stuff that we're working on. And, I, and that's why I think this video is even more unfortunate because people see him as a figurehead, rightfully so, of the Daily Wire. And it allows people to, you know, speak energy into the Daily Wire that isn't necessarily there because he's not there on a day-to-day basis. Okay, that's very interesting. So we, it, if we could take three steps back and give what us the means context. there? Is the Daily Wire um, uh, headquartered in Nashville where she is? Is she like in the office every day? What do you mean there? Because these like media outlets, even before COVID, right? If you were like a talking head or whatever, a lot of times you didn't work in the office. So what? I don't know what she means by there. Debate. How are you on different sides of it? But well, I no. haven't heard you endorsing Hamas. <laughs> like you're not. No. Well, I have not endorsed Hamas in any way, <laughs> and yet people have interpreted things that I say, or actually rather things that I don't say. It's becoming very much reminiscent to me and why I have used my platform to say this of Black Lives Matter, where if you don't say anything, they say your silence is violence. If you say something and it's even handed and it's nuanced, which is to say, you know, during the times of Black Lives Matter, you might say, I don't support police brutality. Who does? I don't support racism. Who does? But also, I think that police are crucial part of every uh, city. We need to have policing in cities. So these calls to defund the police are. She's rehashing old stuff, I think. I'm getting the opi- I'm getting the impression she really doesn't actually want to talk about this. Longer going. Yeah. To also, so what that. she's saying is, uh, those things aren't mutually exclusive. You can have police and also defund the police. Defund the police doesn't actually mean abolish the police. Abolish the police means abolish the police. Defund the police. Actually, I know it's like fucking wild to say this, but defund the police actually just means. To defund the police. Give them a, a single dollar less. You've defunded them. Yep. Yeah. People didn't want that nuance. When Black Lives following George Floyd, there was no nuance. You had to explicitly say, defund the police. Um, you had to post a black square. If you didn't post a black square on Instagram, by the way, specifically on the platform of Instagram, and you maybe were busy that day. Maybe you were in another country. <laughs> you know, maybe you just didn't log on to Instagram. You were accused of being a racist. I'm seeing a lot of that behavior yep, that's, right now. That's definitely why everyone was getting canceled. Lack of black squares. <laughs> I didn't post a black square anywhere, and during the during the uprising of 2020, we were all over covering the protests and stuff, and I didn't really have anybody accuse me of anything. Well, I mean, you know, the general people in Twitch come in here and, you know, <laughs> find out that I'm gay and accuse me of all kinds of shit, but that's, that's not what we're talking about here. <laughs> comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, a conflict that... I have seen every single person, including myself, condemn what happened on October 7th. I have, because who wouldn't condemn terrorism? It's obvious. Who would not condemn innocent Israelis dying? But if you then say that it is also sad when an innocent Palestinian child dies, suddenly this is pro Hamas, or you need to say, even when you're talking about how sad it is that a child dies, you need to button that statement by saying, but that child was a human shield. That's not going to be my response. 
first off, as a mother, that's not going to be my response as somebody who is about to do to give birth when I see these images of children yes. involved on both sides of the conflict. I have pointed to the, the people that are mocking dead Israeli children and said that they are horrific. I am even keel on this matter, and yet people think that you need to be extreme. So people that have become more radical and extreme are perceiving a moderate stance as not enough. And because you, I was about to say, you don't, people can disagree with you or agree with you or whatever, but you certainly don't seem radical on this topic. <laughs> Definitively not radical. Um, my stance has not changed in terms of whether or not America should be involved in this conflict, whether we were talking about Afghanistan. The right calling someone who's Africa. not radical, radical? Wow. It's, that's, it's a, that seems unheard of. It's amazing. It's that, that you know, that uh, uh, the monkeys eating people's face party. I joined the monkeys eating people's face party. And now look, they ate my face. <laughs> clear. They've been documented for years. Whether we are talking about Ukraine and Russia, my comments have been clear and they have been documented. I mean, you can go back to me even talking about NATO expansion before things erupted between Russia and Ukraine yes. and, and having a meaningful discussion about. How yeah, she wants to talk about literally anything but her conflict with Ben here. This is just like her going through and rehashing all of the t other times where leftists and liberals told her to go fuck herself, actually, which is interesting. And is too much expansion. How would we feel if we had troops on our border? These are things that should be allowed in an academic discussion. You should be able to sit on stage. Oh, are you an acad are you in academia? I mean, she, the word academic is the wrong word. This, these things, yeah, of course, they're allowed in discussion, Candace. It's just that other people get to talk too. <laughs> That's the nature of like social media. Now, I am certainly closer to her position on what's going on in the Middle East than Ben's. Absolutely. But that's because Ben is a crazy person when it comes to Israel and Palestine and Gaza and the Likud party and the rest of the coalition that controls the government of Israel. He is a crazy person. And she is a crazy person, too, just not on this issue in that way. I'm sure she's just biding her time to find some way to be crazy about it. Eventually. Oh yeah, yeah. She'll find she'll she'll definitely she's she's actually kind of fallen down on the crazy job here. But her yep. position is just like, <laughs> listen, people are like if her position is like, oh, well, there's all these pictures of children dying, maybe we should stop whatever this is. Like that's like a it's like the most moderate position you could take. And I'm actually stunned. That's not even like just the most moderate position you can take. That's like the bar. Like that is just any position lower than that. And you're a fucking monster. Right. Even if you are, you know, I came, I come to this and I don't want to get too much into it because I actually don't know enough about it. Right. Like historically and whatnot, but I understand what my priors and my bias is going to be in this because of my analysis of power. And I understand who has the power and who does not. But, um, I'm not going to make any really strong statements like beyond that. And she's making an even weaker statement. I don't mean like weak in that, that it's like not brave or whatever. I mean, she's making like a less strong statement than the one I'm making, right? Like a less, there's no power analysis in what she's saying. And people, the people that are the, the people on the right are still losing their fucking minds. Now I'm not here defending Candace. I don't like her. And I think she may be taking the position she's taking due to like knee jerk contrarianism versus any, <clears throat> any interest or care for the Palestinian people. Cause she said a lot of anti-Muslim shit over the years. I don't, can't come up with any examples, but if she hasn't said a bunch of anti-Muslim shit over the years, I would be shocked and I'll shut down this podcast <laughs> like, <laughs> and then I will eat my hat. <laughs> and I like this hat to debate these ideas without using ad hominem attacks to say that you're a pro-Putin pu pu puppet or you're pro-terrorism, even in the aftermath of 9-11, something that we all remember as part of my childhood. I think I was in seventh grade at the time and I'm born in the New York City area. So this was a very big deal. If a person the day after 9-11 wanted to debate the Patriot Act, it's not fair to call them terrorist sympathizers. No. <laughs> well, the Patriot Act didn't exist the day after 9-11. It took a while. Have been proven right in the long run that act we gave up a lot of our freedoms and i think and who was it that was calling people, people that wanted to debate the patriot act terrorist sympathizers uh, generally conservatives but not only conservatives yep.
but generally the uh, the Patriot Act at that time. So it's important, actually, when you start making decisions in a highly emotional time that people sit down and have these academic debates. And there are people that are saying, no, it doesn't matter because people are dead. I think she's just that's a weird quibble, but academic debates are like, well, that's not what's happening here. This is playing out on Twitter and on video and on Tucker Carlson's show, Friendo. <laughs> choose a side, and that needs to be it. It needs to become tribal. There's also, I can't help but notice that I, I, your views reflect mine, I would say, pretty much. I'm, I'm an American. I was horrified by what happened on October 7th. I also think it was pretty strange. Um, I don't really understand how it happened, but innocents died, and that's awful. And I hated watching that. And I feel so sorry for the Israelis. Um, who were killed. However, there's an emotional response that is disproportionate, I think, on the part of some commentators. I mean, our country's being invaded right now by millions of young men. Oh, no. Who probably don't even like America, and they're not. Oh, no. That's. Wow. I mean, okay. this is Tucker. That, that's, that's some blatant racism. Yes, yes, blatant. And it's the great replacement theory. And at the the root of the great replacement theory, I don't know if Tucker believes this or not, but one of the things that people um, who are espousing the great replacement theory believe is that uh, Jewish uh, elites are, or, are orchestrating the uh, migration, maybe not so much into the U.S., but into Europe, definitely. So that's interesting. Living here, over 100,000 Americans die every year of fentanyl. I've known a couple. Those are real tragedies. I've never seen anything like the emotion from any commentator around those tragedies as I'm watching about a foreign tragedy. I think that's odd. I think what, what tends to happen is, of course, we, we all have elements of selfishness within us. And so when it particularly pertains to an issue that impacts you, I, I was strongly speaking out against Black Lives Matter as an organization very early on as a conservative because I understood what the implications were going to be of defunding yeah, so the police. The problem with this is which organization? There was a giant organ, a big national organization that did actually seem, it actually turned out to be kind of a grift. But like that's different than like going to a protest and finding the Black Lives Matter group that is um, like organized in your city or your county or whatever, your, your uh, area. It was an issue that was important to me. I created an entire documentary to talk about this issue. Yes. And I held on for a long time and people began to see that actually I was telling the truth. And now we have more death in inner city communities than we had before. Yes. Um, these, these riots and these George Floyd protests calling for defunding of the police. And I think in terms of this, that's what's also happened is that people that are pro-Israel are pro-Israel, a lot of them, because they have family members in hey, Israel. I get it. They I have get homes it. in yes, Israel. Yes. And so they feel very attached to this issue. Oh, you're leaving out another another factor is that there's fucking this, this evangelical streak. And it's not a lot of people, but it's enough people that they think that the fucking end times will only come when all the Jews return to fucking Jerusalem. And Jesus is going to come down and shit. I don't know if I'm describing it completely accurately, but that's fucking going on in the background here. Like if you, you know, the, um, that organization APAC, that is a, a, a lobbying group for Israel. When you look at like the membership of that, that's a lot of evangelicals and, and like disproportionately American evangelicals and not a lot of American Jews are involved in the uh, lobbying group for, uh, the, the APAC lobbying group because American Jews tend to be liberals and APAC is a right wing organization. You know, I was very happy to host somebody who was pro-Israel. He's a pro-Israel comedian on my show the other day. And I explained this to him. I said, you know, you are demanding that we have this same response that you are having about what people are saying on college campuses. The rhetoric on college campuses hasn't changed. Did you not remember what they were saying, what professors were saying, the anti-white explicit racism that was happening and not even just allowed in terms of student protests, but was written into the curriculum curriculum at these Wait, universities what? for years. People were yes. learning this actively in school, that whiteness was associated with wrongness. You had college professors that were writing about this need to, to, to there need to be less white people in America. You can find Wait, these what? articles. They exist online. They're everywhere. They're and, everywhere. And, and, I, I, I'm just curious like, really? what she means. You can find these articles. They exist online. Where? Right. Even if she just could name one, but the other, the other problem is if she names one, like one professor or whatever, that fucking professor is going to start getting harassed as soon as people hear this. So, <coughs> uh, I mean, I've, I've never heard of any professor taking that stance. 
Right. This is. I've heard of a lot of professors taking the stance of like there will be fewer white people relative to like not fewer white people by number, but fewer white people by percentage yeah. relative to everyone else because that's just how the demographics are changing. They're not saying we need to do that. They're just saying that is what is happening. And I think maybe she's confusing that with someone saying there needs to be fewer white people by number. I think that's what like she's confusing multiple parts of that to come to this weird conclusion. And also like there's a difference too. And I'm, I'm not the best to talk about this, but there's a difference between like whiteness as a construct versus like a white individual. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and that's, it's interesting too, because for a long time in America, Jews didn't get to be white. So yep. that that's going on here too. It's genocidal. I mean, if you're it saying is genocidal. like by definition, if you're saying being a certain ethnicity or race is itself a sin and we need less of you, I mean, isn't that is the definition, is it not? Right. It was not understanding. Yes, to but no one out, is saying that. It was unbelievable. Demographic. I mean, change. I'm sure some people are saying that, but those people are being genocidal. Yes, we would all agree on that. Everyone agrees on that. Demographic change Those people via, don't, they're not popular on the left. I don't know who the fuck they're talking about. So demographic change via immigration and just different, um, and I hate to use the word birth rate, but different birth rate does not make a genocide. That is not a genocide. Yes, but that's not what they're saying. They're saying that someone somewhere, some professor is calling for white people to be murdered or pushed out of the country or something. Uh, I don't know exactly what he means, but he's saying that some professor somewhere is calling for there to, for like us to actively pursue fewer white people in the United States, which I've never seen. I don't know who he's talking about. I don't think that he knows who he's talking about because I don't fair, think she's that the person one, exists. To be fair, just real quick, she's the one who said that, not him. He just agreed with her. He he repeated it. Yes. So yeah. So I think they're both agreeing that that is someone who exists somewhere and is popular on the left. And it's just not right. Like, Again, I, like, I would challenge them to find anyone who's saying that. And well, you if could, they find, could one. find one person who's saying that. Show me how they're popular at all and mm -hmm. show me how the majority of less leftists wouldn't say like, yeah, that person is being genocidal. Right. Or that's crazy. What are they talking about? It's more like what yeah. I would say. This is, this is all, this is all, this is, they're not, they're, they're, they're conflating, they're conflating so much stuff here. They're just building up some straw man to, to knock it down. They're probably not even going to do a good job of knocking it down. Watch. What I was seeing, <laughs> and I was impacted by it because I'm in a biracial relationship and I have biracial children. So you are telling me that my children are going to have to decide between whether or not they are white oppressors or they are black victims. It doesn't stand for me. So I was attached to this issue. No, actually, society gets to decide whether or not your kids are white. That's unfortunate. And that's why some people don't like the concept of whiteness as more, more generally and more broadly is because it is, it is bestowed upon you based upon some characteristics that are outside of your control, just like blackness is. Yep. Uh, case in point, Barack Obama has one white parent and one black parent, but society decided that he was black. And I mean, that's that's fine right like uh, if, yeah. you, if you if unless you don't unless you like barack obama but don't like black people which i'm sure that exists how you find you find one motherfucker right but it, like like this is <clears throat> this is why people this is probably the thing she doesn't like really and she won't like talk about it is that these are all very socially constructed and people don't actually get to decide whether or not they're seen you know, like my, my last long-term boyfriend was one, 100% Salvadorian and he, he got to be white because you know what? He looked white. <laughs> so, but other people from El Salvador who had darker skin and different features, they didn't get to be white, did they? And it's like, well, then that's weird. Maybe it doesn't mean anything. Yep. Something that I exactly. fought for hard on college campuses and there was no support. There was nobody talking about, well, this is what needs to go. We, these kids need to go on to blacklists. And by the way, if they did speak that way, I would have disagreed with it because I am pro 1A. I, you know, I believe in the First Amendment. I believe yes. that kids, by the way, are naturally stupid in case people forget. I started on the left. right? Yeah. So if you found me in college. Yeah, that, that, that grift it, didn't work.
a pro-life person who believed, you know, in some racist principles, you know, fundamental racism in America, because that was what I was being taught systematically yes. in the classroom. And then I got to grow up and change my mind. And I don't think people have thought past their immediate emotions to consider what's going to happen when you put these kids on blacklist. You think that's going to bring them over to the pro-Israel side when they get older? Most of these kids, especially when you're talking about the cream of the crop at these Ivy League universities, already have access to money and wealth and connections. And so maybe debating the issues and explaining to them why it was wrong to sign this specific letter, which didn't call for explicit violence against um, the Israelis, but it actually was very poorly timed and it blamed them for what happened, yes. which would have been horrific. Imagine after 9-11, Somebody issues a letter on college campus that says, oh, well, sorry about the fire department. I, I agree. Yeah, I get No, no, no. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. After 9-11, there are ways in which, and I, I, you're, you don't really blame the U.S., but you go, you know, um, take a look at your foreign policy, baby. It's called blowback. Like, this is a well-known idea. It's, blow, it's not that any particular thing that you did is going to cause uh, terrorism. It's that, like, a, a collection of your foreign policy might make it inevitable but you don't know when you don't know who and you don't know you don't know when yeah you just don't know when where and who but it, it's almost inevitable this is like this is like such a well-known concept uh fucking i think even fucking donald rumsfeld believes in blowback and he's a fucking he's like one of the people that caused the problems <laughs> and imagine and, yeah and by the way i support donors giving money to things they agree with. Yes, I, uh, I, that. I strongly do. Yep. The part that, and so I have no problem with that at all. Same. You don't like it, don't pay for it. Good mm -hmm. for you. However, then I thought, well, wait a second. If the biggest donors at say Harvard have decided, well, we're going to shut it down now. Where were you the last 10 years? And they're going for white genocide. You were allowing. Were they calling? When I, I, who, like, like, this is, he just straight up called it white. This is just a white nationalist, white supremacist talking point now. Now he's not saying that, oh, you know, they want uh, the demographic replacement. Now he's saying a white genocide. Like, yep. th this is just white supremacist shit. This has nothing to do with the thing that they're ostensibly here to talk about either. They're really talking around the thing that is the title of this video. I'm so really hating those people, actually. that You're okay with that? On what grounds were you okay with that? And I, this is what I've been trying to explain to the pro-Israel lobby, that what you are seeing is lack of support, is people that are asking the question is, where were you yeah. <laughs> as we have endured all of you this? You were paying for it, actually. Right. You were paying for it. You were, you were paying for it. you were, were calling okay my children immoral for their skin color. You paid for that. No, no. Why shouldn't I, 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 I hope I, if his kids are still young, I hope his kids grow up to be good and moral people and really piss off dear old dad, honestly. That'd be great. Tucker Carlson's kids grow up and be communists or something. That'd be fan fucking tastic. <laughs> <laughs> he would be so angry. I don't understand. And so that is, you know, obviously you have a, a ton of white people that are asking this question and they're now being called anti-Semitic. And I think that that's wrong. I think these are meaningful questions that deserve to be answered. Why was this uh, this sort of verbiage allowed into the curriculum? I mean, could you imagine if in the curriculum it said that every every Jewish person born is a terrorist? This is systematically what has been said. I would be totally opposed to that. In but this is the, 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 the curriculum, and I haven't seen it, but I imagine it talks about the construct of whiteness, not that every individual white person is a racist. Correct. <clears throat> You're learning this, not even just, by the way, at the college campus level, in high schools. I've covered this on my show at high schools, that they are now allowing children to stand up in an auditorium during, uh, not Black Lives Matter week, uh, during, uh, what is February? African. I heard. Uh, I heard that they're Africa. crucifying all the white kids now. She's talking about, about like. Listen to this. She can't even think. She can't even come up with Black History Month. Watch this. Schools that they are now allowing children to stand up in an auditorium during uh, not Black Lives Matter week uh, during uh, what is February? African. Uh, yeah, for a whole month of February, African American Month. I'm it's totally called Black <laughs> History Month. You dumb fuck. <laughs> 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 Jesus. Black History Month. <laughs> I was like totally blanking. I'm like, what is what is February? Black History Month. They were allowed we at go. this very elite school fifty thousand uh, dollars per a month uh, to attend the school per year to attend the school for these children to stand up on a stage and yell in an auditorium. Black kids were allowed to be on the stage. White kids were sitting down at this elite school, and they said, "You don't know what we lived through. You don't understand what how your whiteness impacts me." This is going on. That's it. She's talking about a private school. Did you hear that? Paid fifty thousand dollars. Well, you know what, lady, that's a private school.
Free market yeah, got you down. I I would agree. Or I would disagree with whatever they were doing there. Like I don't that know. Sounds because, inappropriate. Well, <clears throat> if it happened exactly as she's characterizing it, but yes, if like if true. an elite school that's like predominantly white and rich had some of their black students go up on fucking stage during Black History Month and talk to talk about their experiences of black people, especially maybe in elite circles and how uh, whiteness impacts them in these elite circles like that might be good. Yes. What you just described is good, but that is not what she just described. Well, I, I, we don't, you know, this fucking, this all could have happened in a hipster coffee shop and not at a fucking school. Right. Like, I mean, my guess is it just didn't happen at all, or at least not the way that she's describing it. Definitely not the way she's describing it in New York City right now, that is explicit anti-white racism that is happening. And I covered it on my show extensively. Nobody cared. There, there was no bus calling these kids no. anything wrong. And so trying to explain that of why people maybe are not reacting um, with the amount- I'm guessing no one cared because it didn't actually happen. Or, or it didn't happen the way she described it. Yeah. C is now being interpreted as anti-Semitism. So everyone's being called anti-Semitism. It's a little bit... Also, like, if they were teenagers, maybe they were inarticulate. Because remember she said earlier, kids were dumb and she was a dumb kid. So maybe they were just inarticulate and were... You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like, because they're teenagers. Their brains aren't fully formed. So maybe it was a little more inflammatory than she would have liked it to have been. But she's pushing 40. So of like a 16-year-old might be explaining things in a more inflammatory way because they're 16. Like there's a lot also going on. Also, assuming that there there were teachers. Oh there, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah, yeah. I know. I understand, but I'm just saying that. Like that. She she said that she said that teenagers or, or college students or whatever are dumb, and now she's complaining maybe that somebody during Black History Month said something in a dumb way, and it's like, well, lady, you just called them dumb. <laughs> so what do you want? Like watching the city of San Francisco in the week before Xi Jinping shows up become totally clean, sparkling clean. There are no junkies or rapists on the street. Wait, and what? You feel like asking the Wait, rapists? Um, that's a weird thing because violent crime in San Francisco is actually down. Property crime that's up and drug crime that's up. Violent crime in San Francisco is much lower than other major cities in, in red states. So Other major cities anywhere. Yeah, so... Um, you know, it's this right wing talking point how leftist cities are just dangerous cesspools. And if you go there, you're just going to get stabbed right off the bus. <clears throat> and then you step off the bus, you get stabbed like four times by three different people, maybe even four different people. And it's always been San Francisco. Always. And New you, York. Do you remember? Uh, well, you, I mean, we weren't around for this, but remember a, a long time it was the hippies and the drugs and the hippies and the drugs and the hippies and the drugs. And then it was the gays. And then it was the gays and the AIDS, which was a very dark time for a right wing punditry about San Francisco. And then after like maybe it maybe it became um, a bad for them actually to shit on uh, people who are uh, possibly going to die from HIV AIDS. And then they just went back to like San Francisco values, which is a dog whistle for gay. And now like, not enough people really hate the gays anymore. So now they got to go back to like it's drugs. <laughs> like, oh, yep. and in this case, rape, drugs too. and violent crime. Right. Authorities will wait, you had the power to do this, but you didn't? You had the power to stop racism at Harvard, but you didn't? Wait, what? Why are you not a criminal, actually, right. for allowing that? I don't under, like, have you asked anybody this? Like, direct, have you asked what? a donor this? I've what been was that on the show. I, say, I support what you're doing. It's great. Don't pay for what you don't like. But you did like the, the white genocide stuff. You're kind of okay. Wait, what? Right, and I've even asked, have you, did you use your platform to speak out against it? Because I've been speaking out against this <laughs> for years, and now you're demanding that I use my platform to focus on a conflict that's overseas. Yeah. And the answer I tend to get is no. Uh, I, I didn't talk about what was happening. I didn't realize it was happening. So it, it actually is quite a selfish viewpoint, which we all have. We're all guilty of oh, it. I, I get it. it. I we, get it. we write ourselves into the storyline. How is this going to impact me? And that is, I think, is why it feels existential for other people and not existential for people that have been dealing with this for the last decade. I know, but it's a pretty simple principle that, I mean, uh, existed at 54, I can tell you, in this country for a long time, certainly from say the Civil Rights Act until, I don't know, 15 years ago, you're not allowed to attack people on the basis of their race in public. I mean, everybody has bigoted views probably, you know, or thinks their group is best or whatever, it's pretty normal.
But you're not is allowed it? to say I don't like you because of your race. Like you're not allowed to do that. Why can't <laughs> wow, Tucker Carlson telling on himself right there. <laughs> Standard. I'm missing it. Right. And this has been a dialogue that I think some of us have been having for years. Some people are just now jumping into this dialogue. And I don't fault them, their emotion, but I'm yes. not going to become a radical and rise to that level of emotion. I think my takes have been very moderate. Even people that are reading into things that I haven't said uh, are unable to explain to me why what I'm saying is not okay. They can't point to a specific sentence that I said that was wrong. It's more about how they're reading into the sentence, which if it's how you are reading into it, that is your emotion. But that's interesting because you are reading into the actions of all other different kinds of people at all times. Anytime you're talking about people who are liberal or leftist, right? She's ascribing motive to them. They, they want to eliminate white people. And it's like, well, why do you get to ascribe motive to people based on what they're saying? And people shouldn't do it to you. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, can't take the heat, get your ass out the kitchen. I don't know. Take the money and run, Candace. It's fine. And as I said, my views have not shifted since right. I got into the political sphere. I have always been pro the First Amendment. I have always been pro staying out of foreign conflicts. And I'm sorry if that feels to you like in a, a personal attack, there's this wonderful Thomas Sowell quote uh, where he says that people that are used to special treatment, when you start to treat them the same, feel like they're being discriminated against. He says it much more eloquently. He's Thomas Sowell, Dr. Thomas Sowell, but that's the gist of it. And I think that what we're seeing right now is things that are being perceived as a discrimination. And it's not a discrimination. I'm just treating you the same as everyone has been treated. And uh, throughout my, at least my dialogue and the things and monologues throughout the last six or seven years. Yes. And I do also want to say that I find it particularly despicable, as I have said on my platform, when people who are pro-Israel are now being called anti-Semites for asking meaningful questions. I talked about Charlie Kirk. Charlie Kirk following. Yo, we just on Sunday, Charlie Kirk. <clears throat> Charlie Kirk said an anti-Semitism that had nothing to do with Israel on, uh, we played it on the Sunday show. Somebody could come back and uh, go back and check it out. It was like, it was a very, it was like a very Jews control the world thing. And he didn't like dog whistle about the new world order. He said Jews. So Charlie Kirk uh, doesn't have anything to do with Israel. Charlie Kirk probably supports Israel because he's an ethno, a religious ethno nationalist. And religious ethno nationalists look over there and go, you know, I don't like them Jewish people, but they have the right idea on the policy. <laughs> you know, like. It's October 7th, turned to the Israeli government and said, how did this, how did this happen? You know, he talked about is Israel being the size of New Jersey. He's been there many times. He funds thousands of students to go there and to visit. He's, he, he is, he's honestly radically pro-Israel, I would almost yes. say. It's probably a fair <laughs> thing to say about Charlie right. Kirk. Yeah. And yeah, but, that's, but he said something else. It wasn't about Israel. He was asking these questions with the intent of if these were your children and they were involved in this horrific attack, wouldn't you want to know these answers? He's yeah. like, you can't move five feet without seeing an IDF soldier. I've been to Israel and that is a fact. I admire, I have too, a number of times and I admire their border barriers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See? See? Wow. See, they admire the, the authoritarian structure. They just don't really like the people and their religion so much. It's a, it's a bit of a conundrum for the, for the white supremacist, isn't it? And this coming from the guy who just said, and I'm paraphrasing but only a little here, that he believes white people are the best. That's correct. Yeah, I always think I wish we had that. So I, that's a totally fair question. Totally fair question that he asked, and, and it got interpreted and then there were suddenly these, these attacks calling asking the question of whether turning point was seeping with anti-semitism yes and how unfair how unfair to after all the work that he has done to support your cause no 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 no, no. okay so this this thing okay this this thing right here that this is also anti-semitic she's <clears throat> conflating support of the nation state of israel with uh like liking a jewish people like that's those are two different things it's not the same, and it is anti-Semitic, actually, to essentially conflate the uh, <clears throat> nation-state of Israel with uh, international Jewry. It's just absolutely, that, that's anti-Semitic, actually. Yep. To call him an anti-Semite, because you don't like a question that he asked that actually was being asked from the heart and uh, with a little bit of rage toward... But that's not the thing that happened last week, friendo. It was like a thing he said even being allowed to happen we always it wasn't about have to this hold our governments accountable and how they are responding and plenty of israelis some of whom i know are asking that question and why wouldn't they 
Um, so I, you said a minute ago um, that one of your concerns about having a news story or a public conversation defined by emotion is that it allows the people in charge to change our lives and to take away our civil liberties. Wait, what? We're so distracted by the rage that we feel or the sympathy that we feel. I mean, these are some good feelings too, but- um, th you're, You really think people are stupid and can't think about two things, buddy. Oh, you're distracted by this, so you can't think about this. It's like, man, how many hours do you think there are in a day? And how many things do you think the average person thinks about? And even like what we, we would, he would consider a dumb person. I think you think about a hell of shit during the day. What is he talking about? <laughs> during moments like this. Here, it, case in point, uh, here's a woman who is running for president, uh, the former governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley, explaining that, because of these attacks on October 7th, the rest of us need to register with the government in order to express our opinions online. Here she is. When I get into office, the first thing we have to do, social media accounts, social media companies, they have to show America their algorithms. Let us see why they're pushing what they're pushing. The second thing is every person on social media should be verified by their name. That's, first of all, it's a national security threat. When you do that- Wait, what? All of a sudden, people. What about people stage? outside of the United States that use these services, <laughs> lady? This is stupid for like just on a logistical. It, it's stupid, and then also show us the algorithm. I think she thinks that there's like a fucking envelope there. <laughs> it's like this: push this post, don't push that post. Like, it would be possible to to essentially like source available the algorithm. Like the algorithms aren't actually that complicated. Like, you know, they're not as nebulous as some, say like, you know, a large language model where even if you have access to it, it's kind of hard to tell what it's doing. Uh, the algorithms that they're using are just like mostly human made code. Right. No, no, I'm not saying I'm saying that like <clears throat> I'm saying the way she's talking about it is like, it's just in an envelope in a safe somewhere. <laughs> like, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Well, I, I agree that like those kind of things should be source available, or at least source available to source, at least source like available I, to maybe journalists with uh, with like expert. You know what I'm saying? Like source available. Like they should make it available to some people. I don't know. I don't know the answer. I don't want to get bogged down in this though. Oh, I didn't put that on our bingo card for the show. Dave doesn't <laughs> want to get bogged down. Stand by what they say, and it gets rid of the Russian bots, the Iranian bots, and the Chinese bots. And then you're going to get some civility when people know their name is next to what they say. So Nikki Haley, um, this has been noted on, online, but <clears throat> it's not her real name, of course. It's a pseudonym. And so <laughs> she's not even using a real name and telling us that we have to register with the government under our real names in order to give our opinions. That's obviously uh, contrary to the First Amendment. I don't know why. So that's not what she said. She said in order to use social media, which is not the same thing as giving your opinion. But I do agree that like that's a ridiculous thought that like everyone would have to use their own like legal name on social media. But even when it's something actually ridiculous, he can't help but straw man it. Sort of not at all. It's accountability. But it's fascism, actually. So, like, why isn't Nikki Haley getting laughed off the stage? Well, Nikki Haley is someone that's that not fascism, though. Yeah, if if there was a company out there, and Facebook, I mean, did try to implement, or they said they were implementing a real name policy. If there's a company out there that you <clears throat> to use their social media, you have to use your your you know whatever name is on your ID, and you have to send them their your ID. That's not fascism. That's yeah, just, like to fly on an airplane, you have to use your real ID. Right. I like wouldn't um, name join and, that social ID. media company. Because it would probably be run by the same people that run all the companies now. And I want them to have as little of my information as possible. Thank you very much. <laughs> like, but <clears throat> yeah, this is dumb. This would just be, a, this would just be company. Like the government can't force them to do it. It wouldn't make it through the courts. She doesn't, I don't think she has a, you know, I don't think most people like think about this stuff as much as uh, we do because we cover, you know, the war of ideas on social media. <clears throat> I think the government could force them to do it. The government forces you to use your real name when you get a cell phone. Like oh. you can't get a cell phone anonymously anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's very difficult. I, I think, I don't think it would, uh, I don't think it would make it through the courts. Okay. 
radical. She she's a yeah. radical in this moment, and she's trying to present her opinions as not radical by hiding behind a terrorist attack, and it's not going to age well. So right now in this moment, people are like, "This rhetoric is totally fine." You're going to look back in a year, and people are going to say, "Actually, this was kind of crazy." Some of the things that she said, you know, she in 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 my view has become increasingly radical every time she even hits the debate stage. I don't even know, you know, what country she's running for president in. Uh oh, oh, oh Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley's uh, got some not non white in her background. That's a dog whistle. They also mentioned that she doesn't use her uh, uh, like birth name. That's because her birth name isn't isn't white, right? It isn't a white sounding name. And so they're like, this is this is like I don't like no Nikki Haley. I'd be terrified if she was the president. But uh, it's not because of this stuff. I don't I don't think that she, I'm not concerned about her whether or not she thinks she loves America so much. And this is this is. This is gross, actually. Vivek Ramaswamy called her out accurately. And based on even my own personal experiences with her, which I've documented on my podcast, as somebody who isn't looking to actually win president, no. doesn't want to become president of the United States, what she's looking to do is to secure certain contracts um, after she leaves the stage and, yes. and she loses. And so for her, the motive... And, and Vivek Ramaswamy isn't doing that? that she's going to build and money that she's going to earn as best evidence by the fact that when Lissy not for nothing I think if Trump ends up like not being able to run I think Nikki Haley is going to going to be who they got <laughs> that's going to be who they got Nikki Haley left her ambassadorship she was in she was broke and now she's a millionaire a multimillionaire and you have to ask how that happens and Vivek uh, maybe she made that money in the private sector which you're supposed to like wait she didn't make a bunch of money as an ambassador and then she left her ambassadorship and went to the private sector and made money aren't you supposed to like that right aren't the, isn't she supposed to like that mm-hmm Swami has had the courage to talk about her contract yes. going. So her concerns are not about American citizens whatsoever, which is why it's all about sort of kowtowing to the person that I think that she believes or to, to people that she believes can write her the biggest checks. That's been my assessment of Nikki Haley from the very beginning. It's still my assessment now. Uh, take it or leave. What about what she just said <laughs> would, attack for would attract any company? Like what company is like champing at the bit to to force everyone on social media to use their real name. Yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't like I, I don't want to we're we're like we've passed that in the video. So I'd like to like to kind of kind of stay with well, where we are in the video. Isn't that what but, she's talking about? Yeah, yeah, but like like what I'm like none of this none I I just think they don't like Nikki Haley, right? That that's clear. <laughs> And they know Vivek Ramaswamy has no chance of winning. And um, that actually, if if Trump gets um, if Trump gets gone, I think I I, I think you would be you'd be wise to bet on Nikki Haley. Um, not not Ron Puddin Fingers DeSantis. I I just think you would be it wouldn't be it wouldn't <laughs> be dumb to bet on Nikki Haley. Saying that. And, and in fact, she's not hardly alone in that. I mean, a lot of politicians, in fact, almost all politicians respond to their donors. It is, a, I mean, I'm not, not attacking anybody, but that's just a feature of the business, right? So you say, well, Nikki Haley is responding to her donors, and all of a sudden that's like blood libel or something. It's, it's foolish, and I, and I won't play the game. Obviously, money is motivating for a lot of politicians in D.C. that never leave. I mean, you think? I mean, seriously, it's common sense. And yet, sometimes people try to twist that narrative and pretend that what you're saying uh, cannot be said because in this moment right now, she's being pro-Israel. So not, you can't talk about Nikki Haley. And Wait, what? Me, even though I spoke about this way before October 7th, from the second she announced that she was running, yes. I talked about my personal experience with her and how much she was charging for speaking fees. At the time, it was uh, three hundred thousand dollars plus a private plane for her to go anywhere to speak after she left her ambassadorship and she came with a list of pre-packaged questions so her assistant at the time you were not allowed to ask her one question off script any person that hired nikki haley at this time will tell you this so her answers are practiced her answers are rehearsed and her answers are rehearsed because she wants to make sure that she doesn't upset the people that are, are writing the checks she did all this in the private sector so i said that literally the, the day she announced she was running for president and now all of a sudden something that i've been consistent on is being misconstrued as I, she may be like or, looking to like write a book or like you know g gain more notoriety to maybe join a lobbying firm afterward but i think like if i were her my ca my calculus would be well if trump gets fucking if something happens and trump can't run the rest of these people are fucking clowns and i'm the only one who can string a few sentences together and have some experience <laughs> in the government so 
and people uh, except for Ron DeSantis, but people hate him. Yep. So <laughs> anti-Semitic because and people won't vote for Chris Christie, and I think it's unfortunate that they won't vote for him because he's very fat. And I think the people are very there's just so much bias against that that I don't think they'll vote for him. And more yeah. chance if, than if he was a woman, though, because that bias gets much bigger if you're a woman. Haley is is being radically pro-Israel. So it, it, it does concern me, however, because in America in 2023, the only people... Ooh, I'd like to see if we could look and see if either of these two people have done speaking engagements that uh, included Nikki Haley thing. and charged the same, did the same thing. Like, you got to pay me and fly me out there and uh, give me some fucking cake in the green room. The First Amendment. The foundational right, the right that precedes all other rights, which is the right to say what you really believe and prove you're not a slave. Um, the, the right is the only group that defends. Well, that. you don't have to prove that you're not a slave by saying exactly what you believe. That's crazy. What if you just like to yeah. keep to yourself? I'm not exactly sure what he meant by that. I, I'm just like, I, I know people who's, politics i'm pretty sure i know because of like who they associate with but they don't talk about it so are they slaves that freedom and now they're not now they're saying well actually maybe you need to register with the government before you're allowed to talk but she so didn't he didn't she did like she the thing she said was stupid but again she didn't say that yes yeah so she's talking specifically about social media not just talking or sharing your opinion or whatever and again, we already do that with a number of things. In order to even step foot on a plane, you need to use your real name. Right. Like to, to even get to the gate, the government demands that you give them your real name. Uh, the DMV also demands that you give them your real name for yep. uh, multiple purposes. Yep. The DMV, if you want to drive a car, but the DMV is the government. Yeah, your I think your, your analogy of the airlines is better because the airlines are private and it's just regulation that they're dealing with versus the DMV being the government. Yep. And to, to buy a phone, even to buy like a burner phone, you have to use your real name. So like we already do this and we specifically already do it for a communications device for a communications service. Even like just to get a SIM card, you have to give, the telephone company and, your real name and in this case if it, if you were getting verified by social media they would be the ones verifying your identity not the government yep this is like what she like again i think what she said was stupid like i don't want that i don't think anybody wants that but that that doesn't mean that that to old tuck tuck and uh candace can't lie about what she was saying <laughs> yeah i'm surprised that either tucker doesn't know that you have to give your real name in order to get a phone line or he, he doesn't mind because it's all it probably seems registered. Like it's very... all probably it's all probably registered to like an LLC or whatever for him though. He probably has somebody else probably to deal with it. But like he called it fascism, and like we already do that with phones. So how is that not fascism? Now, wouldn't, if he was consistent, wouldn't he already think that we are currently living under fascism and have been since like I think it was like two thousand eight that that law passed. So if the left's obviously opposed to the First Amendment, now a lot of the right is opposed to the First Amendment. So, like, how do we keep the First Amendment? Yeah, I think this kind of... Wait, is are people opposed to the... I bet the First Amendment poll's pretty fucking high in the United States of America if you go around and ask people, what's your favorite <laughs> amendment? I bet a lot of people be saying the first one. Yes, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of people would say the second. And if very you few. asked for their top two, it would probably be one and two for those people, though. And very few, like me, would say the 14th. It's almost what Trump was referring to when he talks about the swamp. You know, they get a little taste of, of what they can earn for themselves, and they kind of go further into this, and it actually doesn't become about America at all. And I think at this particular moment, you are seeing a, a fracturing on the right. There are people that are pro-America, America first. I am a person that considers myself pro-America, America first. And it absolutely makes my skin crawl when people try to tie America's success to what we have to do overseas. I, I, I believe in national sovereignty. I believe that America has what it takes here at home to be a great nation. And yes. actually, I think history sort of tells us that once we started this campaign of international liberalism following right. World War II, things uh -oh. are really falling apart, yes. especially this... Uh, a, a deep, uh, a steep decrease following the 1960s, without question. I mean, socially. Uh oh, what happened? Oh no! 
Oh boy. Look at the two ta- two things she thought. Like look at her two time points there. She's like, yep. oh, we have, we, we imposed a or we we were part of a an international liberal order post World War Two. Uh, that is actually dog whistly about the fucking Frankfurt School and shit. But that's I don't think she knows what she's doing there. She's just repeating what she's heard. And then uh, after the sixties, actually things got bad again because uh yeah. So what happened in the sixties? I forget. I forget. Maybe some, nothing important. Some sort of some sort Beetle of Beatlemania. <laughs> This is the moon landing. Morally, economically, clearly. this has been a nation that's in decline. And so I cannot stand when I see these politicians on stage emoting and saying sentences like, we can do both. Look around you. Does it look like we can do both? Where is your evidence to support the claim that America can do both? Because I'm looking around and it's very clear, it's very obvious that we cannot do both. Uh, our children are failing academically. People are fearful to go into inner city communities. We have people that are suffering from depression, overdosing on fentanyl. We're fundamentally an unhappy. People are fearful to go into inner city communities because of these things. She means she means black communities, because like people live in inner city communities. A <clears throat> bunch of people. Inner inner city is is uh, fucking code for like black and Hispanic or Latino. Don't most people in the U.S. live in inner city communities? Yes, HK. But that's not what they mean. Okay. <laughs> that might be a, like not the majority, but a plurality. Yeah. I don't know okay. exactly. But, but when she says inner city, she means the ghetto. Okay. We don't have an identity. We've completely lost what it means to be an American. It is why I, I feel very inspired. Uh, when and I by the, the, the people that she says are afraid to go there, she means white people. And her. And talk about American yes. principles. I hate the way that they you know, they illustrate their opinions about people that want that old America, that are nostalgic about that America. When someone says, and I've, I've heard of this statement, and I can't remember who said it, but you can't be pro-American unless you're pro-Israel. I just thought of the person who's probably in West Virginia who had both his legs blown off. I right, do find it overseas, interesting that a lot of who people is, who are nostalgic for like 1950s America were born in like the 70s. <laughs> yeah, um well it's it's that's nostalgia is oftentimes <coughs> you know for a made up past. <laughs> yep, <laughs> stupid and wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pro-american and you're telling him that no 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 unless you agree that every single war should be everywhere you're not you're not pro-american we've lost our identity i mean that's completely a foolish thing to say and i say this as somebody who if i was gonna be radical anything i'm probably radically pro-uk right i married yeah. a, i married a brit radically children, pro-uk um, that's a fuck not even a very bold i mean i think the uk is pretty cool too i mean uh, you know we had that one fight but other than that like america <laughs> and the uk have been thick as thieves right <laughs> That one fight a long time <laughs> ago. Everything's, everything's fine now. <laughs> <laughs> fucking, I mean, it's, it's fucking turf island, but I'd, I'd, I'd be fucking, if, I, if somebody gave me a fucking all expenses paid trip to London, I'd be like, hell yeah. Uh, that is a blemish, but um, the UK is all right. Have dual citizenship. I'm, I'm also pro UK. Descendants. That no. to be pro America means to be pro British. I love oh, the Brits. I love oh, wow. everything about, you know, I, I love being in the United Kingdom. I mean, decidedly, I America is <laughs> like kind of founded on being anti British, but like, admittedly, we got over that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody cool. <laughs> everybody invited to the barbecue, except don't let the British people cook the beef. Pro American, it means to be pro American. I couldn't, even, as someone who's ancestors from the UK, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, you you got to kind of wonder. Tucker's one of those people that knows the names of his ancestors from the UK because they were that rich that they were they were like records kept of them. This is going now <laughs> that you know basically no one in the establishment in Washington is for the front runner in the Republican presidential primaries. Trump gets the nomination like what happens then? I think you're going to probably see the same things that we saw in 2015 and 2016. I think there has always been a never Trump contingent. Right. It has manifested itself now as pro DeSantis. A lot of the never Trumpers became, you know, very pro DeSantis. Yep. Um, some uh, that's not what the polls the say. People that are war hawks, <laughs> people that want to kind of keep the military industrial complex going right. everywhere. People uh, who have always been anti Trump. So, hate speech laws. Yeah, hate speech laws that are dressed up. Wait, as wait, wait, wait. 
did what did Trump do? Uh, Trump was like, our military needs to be the biggest, and we need to fucking have space military and shit. What the fuck? There's nobody more pro military industrial complex than Trump. He extended that shit to space, motherfucker. Or noble, <laughs> and it's like, no, this is actually a law that is is fundamentally anti speech. And if you want to debate that, we can, and we should have that debate. But it, again, always seems to be reduced to smears and libels, and not an academic discussion, which it should be. So well, then go be a professor. I don't think this is new. I think it's just kind of reappeared as something else. And we have always when had she says people. academic, does she just mean that nobody's making fun of her? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's okay. one of the, the through lines of our show, actually. Right. Is that the, the it doesn't really matter what you say about her or uh, Sam Harris. Like if you as long as you say it in what sounds like a polite tone and never make fun of them, they, they won't like block you on Twitter. But as soon as you make fun of them, that's that's the, the ultimate sin is not taking them yep. seriously as a fucking you're, you're you're coming in bad faith, you're you're being non academic, right, you're ad hominem mominging all over the place. Right. And it's <clears throat> it's just a it's it's a way to like shut the uh, um, uh, humor out of the discussion because humor doesn't work for them. <laughs> 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 yeah. Not not so good at humor. So they would maybe yep. want to uh, maybe want humor directed at them to be looked at as like lowbrow or not worthy of uh, uh, marketplace of ideas. But the marketplace of ideas, it gets messy. Will they, <laughs> when they get to the ballot box, vote against Trump principally? Well, they did it in 2015 and 2016, and it, it didn't have an impact. And I think in 2020, they probably, I don't, I don't know if they cast their votes for Biden. I don't know that they would. I I have stayed taken home. myself out of political prognostications entirely. Yeah. It's very difficult, I think, Wise. now. Yeah, because I obviously am always hoping that America wins at the ballot box. People that are focused on American initiatives. America okay. wins at the ballot. Like, uh, is America on the ballot? America, yes or no? <laughs> I'd vote no just to <laughs> fuck around. <laughs> wouldn't, that be wor wouldn't it be horrible if hella people just said no because they thought it was funny and then all of a sudden there was no America? <laughs> <laughs> Vote no for America. <laughs> On wanting citizens to be successful here, not making them feel guilty about wanting to feed their families, not making them feel guilty about what they're seeing at the gas station that they can't afford, despite the fact that they do what they're supposed to do day in and day out. They wake up, they go to work nine to five, and the government is taking Elite everything and telling them that there's something, there's some new moral crusade. Who controls the gas prices? There is a new moral crusade. The left. Was it Joe Biden? It's us. Every day Joe Biden gets up and he's like, you know what? Today, I'm going to raise it a dime. No, it's actually me. Because I ride a bike. <laughs> See? Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> I feel like it's the gas companies. I could be wrong. There's a lot, I feel a lot like of, it's the a, gas companies that control the gas prices. There's a lot of people with their reaching their hand in and taking a little something, something actually there. A lot of people. That's how, it's how, uh, it's how, it's how <laughs> supply chains and big corporations work. State, how many have we lived through in just the last two years? COVID, it was a global moral but crusade. But food prices are never a moral crusade, I, never, I notice. Never, never. God forbid you want to. Who controls the food prices? A pack of bacon for your family. God forbid you say that. Is it Joe Biden? Um, I, I, depending on what time of year it is, that makes you a grandma killer. <laughs> that makes you whatever a, a pro Putin puppet. It, it this makes is just you like her grievances. This is like it. the the festivus airing of grievances. Right. But on the like Tucker show, she hasn't power. talked about fucking Ben at all. <laughs> Candace Owen responds yep. to Ben Shapiro and Tucker Carlson interview. No, she doesn't. <laughs> families yep. that would like to put american <laughs> principles first so if there's no further argument and it's just going to be smears and libels we like to turn the chapter um and get talking about how we can actually do that how we can actually fix america who do you listen to when you're trying to figure out i mean some of the stuff comes at you so fast and you're talking almost every day or writing almost every day um who do you read or listen to to try to make sense or bounce ideas off of you know you i trust? have been obsessed with thomas how Sowell. do you bounce ideas um, off I, of something you're reading knows that i am pretty much a thomas soul groupie everything he rewrites i read and it is because he finally he was a part of my awakening story into politics and made me focus on the economics which is to say block out the noise and pay attention yes. to the economics go backwards in history to understand where we are when has this worked oh it's never worked so there's telling me that it's going to work into the future and there's no evidence to support their nirvana fallacying this which i don't even know what this is 
They're Nirvana fallacying just a broad idea of this. This has never worked. It's never, but the, the, you're like, what does that mean? What would perfection be? What if it is working? What if everything is working as well as it can? And fucking, it's just not great because humans, you know, just not great. <laughs> like, I mean, it's definitely working for some people. Working for her. Yeah. So I think a lot of times in this environment, it's important to almost block out the noise and to focus on the things that matter. Uh, uh, the the economic debates that people are having right now, which don't make sense. So how much more debt can America be in as you're right. trying to convince us? But every country is in debt. What if we're just like Mulligan? Get out of it if we just commit to one more, more one more war. By the way, where is all of this money going? It's incredible to me that the government has the ability to reach into our accounts and to read every single line of what we spend down to your Zelle payments and your PayPal, and yet we just can't get an accounting for how- Oh, have you been audited? But did you get audited recently? Because they usually don't actually do when that. When tech works and when tech fails people. They can, um, but they don't. I would don't. say in terms of being inspired by people, I am very much inspired for different reasons. And people will find this very weird. Obviously, I've been very open about the fact that I'm, I've been tremendously inspired. So the reason like, people keep talking, like they talk about America's debt. First of all, we don't owe the really money to anybody. Most of it we owe back to ourselves, which is weird. Sort of, we owe some of it to China, but that's that's the only thing maybe that's troubling, except they're not trying to collect, because then what do they do? They're like, oh, well, we're just not going to sell you anything anymore. And you're like, great, we're not going to pay our debt. And then fucking, boom, the world economy dis is destroyed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like we have foreign debts, and we also have domestic debts, and we can borrow domestically essentially infinitely. Like, eventually, we would not be able to repay it so we would just have runaway inflation which has happened before or not to other or countries or maybe we wouldn't have runaway i mean maybe the runaway inflation in other countries might be due to other factors too i don't know like it's really hard to like um really hard to like argue with like if somebody owes you money and you come to collect it's really hard to argue with them parking an aircraft carrier off your uh off your coast <laughs> did you know what i'm saying well like that's like you know, what all way... of it's backed by it's backed by it's backed by a, we could actually blow you the fuck up. That's like, <laughs> they, 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 that's missing from any economic analysis It's like, nobody's going to, are the fucking debt is not going to come home to roost because we can be like, Oh, look at this aircraft carrier we bought with your money. Oh, now it's off your coast. <laughs> <laughs> well, like the way we could reduce our debt, which is different than the deficit. The way we could reduce our debt is by increasing taxes. Sure, I'm, I, I, we're not going to talk about this. We're almost done with this fucking video, and I want to get out of this. Well, I just wonder how Candace feels about that solution to the problem that she says is a problem. These people just want to cut benefits. They don't actually care about the debt or the deficit. All they want to do is cut benefits to poor people. The rest well, of it's they also all... want to cut taxes. So and any, right, anytime they cut I'm a saying. benefit, they cut taxes and then they've done nothing and that's, our debt HK, just grows. HK, this is all a ruse. They want to cut benefits to poor people. Yes. ...by you in my career. And I'm not, I'm not just saying about you. I've said this long before. Um, Tucker Unleashed has been the greatest thing. It is something that we have needed and it has been a great addition to the American campaign. Um, I also am inspired. Tucker Unleashed. I, yeah. He is so different from. Was the Tucker on a leash he before? Very, X Man now. And yet, in this weird way, his fight for freedom, what he did for Twitter, is something. There are no words to illustrate what I that agree. actually meant in terms of the global conversation. He is. An, he, he is a hero. You know, if everything else. Uh, uh, does she mean that, Elon? Would, yes. He, yeah. Yeah. She's talking about apartheid cloud right now. Seriously? Yeah. He just made Twitter into like a virtual Nazi bar. That's what she wants. Okay. Measured as a good man, and that that's my belief. I agree with I'm that. I'm inspired by people like Dana White. Yeah. The, the ability to, during BLM, I absolutely love Dana White. Um, people don't realize what sort of pressure was on him. Yes. Uh, to being the first person to say, we're not shutting down the UFC. Allowing, by the way, which is something that is so beautiful, the differing opinions to take place in the UFC. Oh, yeah. He will, does not care if you come out in an Israeli flag, a Palestinian flag, a BLM flag, a pro-America flag, and then the press will put pressure on him and you hear him and he's like, so what? 
These are, they're going to bash each other. No, because it's all about spectacle. There is a bit of kayfabe going on there. Oh, you're no, so stupid. What they're yeah, of course he know. wants the political that spectacle means around the these UFC. Are, these are little battles that we're winning, and people are fighting them on different fronts. And these are the cultural people, the political people, Thomas Massey, for being the most consistent congressman in terms of what he supports and what he doesn't support, uh, is someone else that I admire. So uh, there are a lot of different people that I admire, but I think what they all have in common is that an underlying belief that none of them have made fun of me yet. And a hatred for people who are trying to tell you it's freedom when they are trying to censor you and to belittle you and to smear you and to libel you. It does feel. Uh I mean, libel's a legal term. This, but just your gut level sense of who's winning and who's losing right now, it seems to me nobody I'm lying to myself that the we all suck and we're all losing. Sensible, common sense oriented <laughs> people who want basically all the same things: a happy, stable, safe life for their families. Ooh, somebody in chat noticed too that that, that uh, it's that um, <clears throat> the uh, UFC didn't shut down during COVID, not because of Black Lives Matter. She just conflated the two. <clears throat> that's interesting. I didn't. I didn't even catch that. It flew right past me. It's a good thing sometimes the chat is here to be like, "Hey, hey, stupid! You missed something." You seem to be winning. What I want to say to those people because I know that sometimes you you wonder if the world has gone mad. The world hasn't gone mad. Some people with big platforms who have gone mad have gone mad. Uh, but it will always pay in the long Ooh. run to stay on the side of morality, to be you know moderate in your opinions to not ever Wait, fault yourself for wanting to feed your family first yes uh, it makes perfect sense i would never rush over while my while my child was dying and starving and feed the neighbor's child no right i would feed my child first and if there was leftovers i would obviously accommodate the person next door and that's called and that's probably not a problem in your neighborhood and i want those people to know that i do feel what you are feeling and i think that we are in a unique time in america i think the cultural conversation is switching i think more people are beginning to buck bad trends and the more of us who stand up for that morality, the more people that will be encouraged by that standing up and who will join us. Do so. you find yourself thinking about... So God how about movies? someone like Elon Musk who has more money than it would take to feed literally everyone who's starving in the United States permanently for the rest of their lives? And he still just wants more. She admires him. She admires him. Okay. She wants yeah. you as an individual to feed your neighbor, not... We don't know societal action on that. That's different. It's all about okay. the individual, baby. Okay. That standing up. Yeah, for a show was, called Tucker on X, Tucker seems to be by pretty docile. That standing up and who will I don't join think us. he's really on it. find yourself thinking about God more than you used to? Yes, <laughs> without question. <laughs> really? Yes, it, it is just one of those things. I've never been Does she keep track? Uh, more confident in who I am as a person. And I think that that needs to be said. And... A couple of years ago, or I would even say just getting started in politics, it's it's a wild world. And you do realize that people do sell out. You do realize that there are people that don't have courage to say certain things. There's a lot of backhanded messaging and texting that's going on uh, because people have aligned themselves to groups and not principles, which I think is wrong. But something changed for me uh, spiritually when I got married and when I had children. And I would say that I became laser focused and I've never felt more secure. I've never felt more sure that I will land on my two feet if I follow a path that I deem to be righteous. And well, that's, I am that's not because you have so much goddamn money now not speaking these things to myself. That's God operating. That is God that is operating and it is the call upon all people. Uh, to to be righteous in their approaches to things. And that when you can't live with your own actions, just say God wanted you to do it. But I'm confident, and I think people are... And that are, will help you sleep at night. ...very angry about that confidence. I think they can see the happiness that I have, and they're angry because that means that it's less of an ability to control what I say and to control what I think. But I'm still the same girl from the wrong side of the tracks. <laughs> um, I understand people, and I... I can't sell out to anybody. I, I, I demand to be free. It's not an arrogant false confidence. It's real. And I, I find it inspiring. Candace Owens, thank you very much. What an honor. I'm so and congratulations excited. on this baby. I can't overstate. I don't want any tight shots. Boo. Boo. Like, she, I thought we were going to get some tea. I thought they were going to spill the tea. They just did some racisms. Yeah, like they barely, they, I think they might have talked for a minute about Ben Shapiro, not including them running that 30 second clip. So, like a minute 30. And then she like talked about how much yep. she loves the people at the Daily Wire. Like she, that wasn't, and that wasn't about it at all. 
gonna have to come back to this yeah. next week, everybody, because there might it there might be more. I don't know, fucking, or maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll watch something better next week. Who knows? It's been a fucking crappy couple of weeks as far as the content we've been watching <laughs> around here, at least during the regular show. My God, whatever. I would I would ask if we learned anything. We didn't learn anything. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we became knowledgeable about things that are terrible. Ooh, I think most of those things we were already knowledgeable about. Yeah. Anyway, uh, read the show out and I'll play the song and we'll, we'll get, we'll get the drinks and do the thing. All right. Thank you for tuning in. This has been the intellectual dollar tree. We do this show live on Twitch every Wednesday at 7 PM Pacific. That's twitch.tv slash echoplex media. Uh, after we play our and ending song we change the lights red and have an after show so if you're listening live we'll see you on the other side of the song and if you're listening on the podcast version maybe check us out live sometime if you want to check out any of our other shows you can check them all out at echoplexmedia.com and if you want to support us you can do that at echoplex at uh, patreon.com slash echoplex or eplex.store and this is boomers by periscope